I've got 130. Sort of what I was getting at is. Uh, I guess the computer's not ready to do schools. Recording in progress. Good to go. All right. <coughs> Good afternoon. The time is 1.30 p.m. and I hereby call the January 12, 2022 meeting of the Area Border Zoning Appeals to order. Uh, before we begin, we do have a few announcements. The Area Board of Zoning Appeals meeting is being held in person and virtually in the fourth floor council chamber of the county city building with Zoom video and phone teleconferencing options available via links and phone information posts on our website, sjcindiana.com abza. The meeting call-in number is 312-626-6799. The meeting ID is 961-6443. 3903 and the password is 543186. Due to issues with usage of video by persons viewing the meetings, the county has determined that it is appropriate to require during virtual and partially virtual meetings that members of the public viewing meetings keep their microphones and cameras turned off. The host of the meeting will turn the members of the public's microphones off. During portions of the meeting where the public participation is permitted, the participating member of the public will have their microphone and, turn and camera, if any, turned on. If a member wishes to participate in this portion of the meeting, they should indicate this by raising, using the raise hand function in Zoom and or by messaging the host in the chat function. When on the phone, please use star nine to use the raise hand feature to be called on, and you can use star six to unmute yourself. To use the raise hand feature on Zoom video, click the controls on the bottom of your screen. If you do have two computer video windows open or have a phone line active with a video window open at the same time, you're gonna create an echo effect making hearing you impossible. Please choose one option or the other. Regarding public comment, we will first ask for any public comment from those sitting in the chambers, then in the auxiliary seating in the building, and once those in person have provided their comment, those calling into the meeting remotely will be given the opportunity to provide public comment. Please clearly state your name and address. Please don't be surprised if you are asked to spell your name for the record. Your speaking time will not start until after this is done. We ask that board members state their name when at making a motion in a second as well too. Lastly, please silence or turn off your cell phone so they do not disturb the meeting and the other people in it. Um, may we have a roll call please? Mr. Hawley? Here. Mr. Moffat? Here. Mr. Ritzma? Here. Mr. Schaefer? Here. Mr. Tavenier? Here. Mr. Veldman? Here. With that, we will begin the uh, election of officers for the uh, 2022 sessions, and I will turn it over to our lovely city, our Grant County Attorney. Uh, so the first position is the chairman of the board. Uh, are there any nominations for chairperson? I nominate DJ Tavenier. Is there a second for that nomination? I'll second that. Are there any other nominations for chairperson? Seeing none, the nominations are closed. All in favor of DJ Tavernier as chairperson, please say aye. 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 Any in favor? Any against? No. All right. New chairperson. You do the same thing for the vice chair office. Oh, oh just throw me in there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's how it works. Finally get to sit next to you, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just ask for nominations for vice chair. All right, so next up is vice chair. So a nomination for a vice chair, please. I nominate Mr. Bob Holly. Can I second? Uh, you should not second. No, okay. you should request a second. Okay, I need a second. I'll, I'll second. second Sid Schaefer. <laughs> then you ask if there's any other nominations. I thought you were doing this. I did it for, <laughs> you, you have gotten the spot that lets you do it. Oh. Now, so. You're now in charge. Okay, uh, so is there any other <laughs> nominations for uh, vice chair? No? Uh, so the nominations are closed. So the nominations are closed. Any, uh, everybody... All in favor? All in favor. There we go. Signify I'm not. Signify. Yeah. All in favor for uh, Bob Holly being vice chair? Aye. Aye. Say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Hearing none. Congratulations, Bob. Right, thank you. Congratulations, <laughs> CJ. 
Is that it? I didn't see the train. That's, all, the, that, that's all you have to do for the election of the officers. Now you get to move on to the main agenda items. All right, so now we can move on, right? Yep. Should, uh, switch your name tags around. <laughs> no, I like being Joe today. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize I was doing all of this today. So you would have worried if, if you knew that you would have worried about it leading up. If, if I would have known this, I would have probably changed my mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we should probably cover the fact that we need so many yays. Yes. So uh, this is uh, is this part of this on here? Yep. It's right at the top. We see All right. Uh, if less than. If less than a seven members are present of this chair now. Oh, sorry. We have, a f we have six members here today present. This is a seven member board. If you feel your petition needs to be heard by f the full board, please let our staff know and we will, be, we will table your petition until the next meeting where we uh, could have all of our members in attendance. May we have the reading of petition number one, please. Location. 13835 Creston Street. Owner, Corey Renee Wall. Requested action. Variances, one from section 154.070 sub C, A, two to allow a two foot rear setback where eight foot is required for a storage shed. Zoning R, single family, district, county. Okay. Um, may we have the presentation by the petitioner, please? Uh, staff. staff. By the staff member? Yeah. Staff. This is backwards. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. This is Sean Klein, Area Plan Commission staff. Um, as you might recall, this is a petition that was tabled from the December meeting. Uh, it concerns a 480-square-foot uh, accessory structure that was built within two and a half feet of the northern property line of this parcel. Uh, therefore, it is not meeting the eight-foot rear setback. Um, this came to our attention when it was red tagged by the building department for a uh, permit not being pulled for construction of the structure. It was actually constructed to replace a um, 96 square foot structure that was legal non-conforming at that location. So had they constructed a structure of, that, of a similar size, um, they would have been able to do that. Um, but in this case, the legal non-conforming status does not apply to the um, significantly larger structure. So they would need the uh, variance we're considering today in order to keep it in place there. Um, when we turn to the state law criteria for consideration of a variance, uh, the first point being that the approval will not be injurious to public health, safety, morals, and general welfare of the community. Uh, staff finds that allowing the shed to remain in its current location uh, likely would not have any impact on those elements. Um, but when we turn to the use and value of the area adjacent to the property included in the variance uh, being affected in a substantially adverse manner, uh, we do believe that a structure of that size within two and a half feet of the property line um, could adversely affect the enjoyment of the neighbor's property, um, their resale value potentially. And additionally, it might be difficult to maintain the structure without trespassing onto the neighbor's property. Uh, we also find that um, the petitioner did not demonstrate that the strict applicability of the terms of this chapter would result in practical difficulties, um, mainly because although a large portion of the property is not level, um, there is adequate space uh, within the yard to have built this meeting the uh, rear setback. Um, additionally, at the past meeting, uh, we were working out potential ways to bring this into conformance, and we found that the northern wall could be moved back such that it is eight feet from that northern property line, and then the roof could still encroach into that rear setback by three feet, so it would only have to be um, five feet back, and then the concrete that's there, that could actually remain where it is because there is no rear setback for the concrete portion. Um, consequently, due to the lack of practical difficulty because there are options there to bring this into compliance and the fact that it could have an adverse impact on neighbors' properties, uh, staff recommends denial of this variance. Um, as pointed out 
at the last meeting, we did receive uh, three letters in support of this variance from the neighbors, and those were provided to the board once again. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So did they contact you at all for any resolution on their end to whether they wanted to do this or not do this? Uh, we discussed it briefly, and they came to the conclusion that they'd rather um, just take it to this meeting and see what the outcome is here today. So just what was the reason that we, uh, could you refresh my memory, the, the reason for tabling it was what? It was my understanding that um, they were, that the petitioner might have wanted the time to work out how to bring the uh, property into conformance without the variance. Thank you. So just so I understood, if they move the wall back, the roof line can stay, the concrete can stay. Concrete is pre existing. The concrete can stay. The roof line will have to be five feet back, so I'm That's not sure where sure it's of. falling so, currently. So even but if they, they move the whole thing, the, the roof line could abut a little bit into it. A little bit, three okay. feet into it, right. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Understood. So the max they could have would be a five foot setback, realistically. For the roof, correct. Okay. For the overhang. Yes. For the overhang itself. Yes. The building itself has to be eight, eight feet. feet. Correct. Anybody Thank you for the clarification. Anybody else? No, nope. is the petitioner uh, in-house? All right, make your way up there. Name and address, please. Good afternoon. My name is Corey Waugh, and my husband. Justin Waugh. And our address is 13835 Creston Street. <coughs> okay, so... Um, so obviously we're here again, right, for this. Right. So what what is the, Well, if I remember correctly, you guys did this yourself, right? We did. You poured um, the concrete yourself. You framed yes. the building yourself. There was a shed that was burned, burned, down. burned down, right? Yeah. Right. The reason we wanted to table it for the um, next meeting is because we felt like we wanted to have the most board members available at this time to hear our case. Um, and... The reason that we built, had to rebuild a shed is because our previous shed burnt down in July, last July. Um, and so we were under the impression, we didn't realize that we needed to get a permit when we were putting it right back in the same spot. So, you know, that we apologize for that misunderstanding and we have absolutely no problem getting the required permit for that. Um, but the reason we put it right back where it was at is because that is really the only feasible spot to put um, a shed. And that is because it's kind of hard to tell by the aerial view, but if you look from our, if there's a front view. So the front view of our house is basically not front yard, it's front hill. It's just a hill that drops straight down. And then the flat area down below is zoned for water runoff. So there's a water culvert down there in the corner and when it rains, that whole front area is a lake. So nothing can be built there. Nothing can be built on the front of our house here. So on the side along Creston Street, that starts to slope downhill as well. And that has water runoff down that side. So in the backyard here, we have a tiny area that we have fenced in for our children to play. And we have septic tile that comes in towards on that back corner. In addition, we have our well that's like pretty much right in the middle of the backyard that's um, fenced in there. So really the only area that is flat enough to build anything is the spot there where our previous shed was, which is why the, pers the owner who built that one probably 30 plus years ago built it in that spot and why we chose to put it right back in that spot as well. Um, and in fact, if you look at the aerial view, um, all four properties that meet up in that corner there, they all have a shed in that corner that meets up there because in all four of those properties, it's the only flat area that you can actually put any sort of a shed there. Um, so that was our reasoning behind that. Um, we, do, uh, we do have a letter um, from the neighbor specific, we have one from our next door neighbor and then also specifically from the neighbor to the north of us who where the setback is in question. 
and she wrote us a letter stating that she has no problem um, with where it's at, especially since something had been there before. Um, and her house is not like right next to that property line, it's up further, so she didn't feel like it would affect her value of her home or her property at all. Um, and so also be, it is two and a half feet back from the property line. And so we're able to maintain it fully by staying our, on our side of the property. We don't have to go over to her property all at all. In fact, when we built it, we didn't have to go across or ask for permission to go over to her property at all as well. I think you may have answered this, but just to recap, uh, you purchased the home and the original shed was there. It was, yes. Right? Yeah. Do you happen to know whether that individual got a building permit to build that shed back then? I'm not aware of that. I know that I've kind of lived within this neighborhood my whole life. Um, and as far as I can remember, I always remember seeing a shed there. It's, it was probably at least 25 years old, this shed. So I'm, I'm not aware of what they did to construct it or not. I just know it's been there quite a long time. So you inherited the shed? We did, yeah. The, the one that burned down, yeah. Thank you. How big was the shed that was there originally? Um, it was 96 square feet. Um, so it was pretty compact. Um, so the shed that was there originally was 100 square feet, 96 square feet, but the right. shed that you built is five times that. So the reason that we decided to do that was because we wanted to keep it in the same spot that it was because it was the only spot to build it, but also, you know, we have a young family, and so we, all, we have lawn equipment like a lawn tractor, we have a pull behind leaf picker upper that we pull behind. We have a small trailer that hooks up to our tractor. We have bikes, we have the kids sporting equipment, things like that. And so we were attempting to make it a little bit more family user friendly. And the concrete that was, I know I've asked this once already, <laughs> but the concrete that was poured, you did yourself. Yes, sir. 100%. Yes, we door. did. The other thing I'd like to mention is where the garage or the shed sits right now, it was already tight up against the trees. So once, when it went up in flames, there's a maple on the left side of it, about 15 feet up, it's all black and uh, scorched from just the flames and the heat. So just with that tree into the trees to the right and then trees to the left side, I mean, it's pretty much, you're trying to fit a square inside of another square there was really no other recourse as far as which way to move yeah, it. And move we it tried to tuck it in it there as best we could where the other shed had been. So the existing concrete that was there to begin with, was that already two and a half feet off of the fence or did you take your new concrete two and a half feet to the fence? We put our concrete two and a half feet back from so our property So the existing line. shed wasn't as close as what this shed is now? It was, it was closer than eight feet, but it was probably not two and a half feet off, but it was close, it was closer than eight feet for sure. Okay, you good? Okay, anybody got any questions? No? Thank you. Uh, now we can open this up to the public for anybody in favor of this petition <clears throat> or on Zoom. No? Okay. Anybody against this petition in house or on Zoom? No? Okay. So we can close it to the public now. So, anybody got anything that they want to say, ask, talk about? Am I missing something? Nope. Oh, you're smiling. You're looking right at me, so I smile back at you. <laughs> <laughs> because you always looked at me when you were sitting here. <laughs> I was looking past you, but that's okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, while, while um, I understand uh, the staff's uh, point on this because it uh, there, there are not 
complete and total um, difficulties or practical difficulties with this lot, there are enough difficulties in my opinion that um, <coughs> I would uh, make a motion to approve this variance um, with the two foot rear setback. Um, while they did construct themselves a little bit closer than the previous one was, if you look at the aerials and the different views that we saw it on site, there's four sheds that sit basically in that same triangle and, and with the neighbors not really having any difficulties with what the, this petitioner is doing, I would make a motion to approve it as requested. Motion. Uh, I'll second it. I'll second it. Shelley. Mr. Moffat. Yes. Mr. Ritzma. No. Mr. Schaefer. Yes. Mr. Veldman. Yes. Mr. Hawley. Yes. And Mr. Tavernier. Yes. Uh, based on the testimony presented here today, the Area Board of Zoning and Appeals, after careful consideration, <coughs> finds that petition number one and variance of two foot from the rear setback is granted, and we will issue findings of, or we will issue written findings of the facts. Sorry. Thank you. Can we hear petition number two, please? 18325 Bailey Avenue. Also known as 54196 Burdett Street, lots 263, 264, and 265, Hepler's Morningside Edition, and unaddressed abutting property to the east, lot 266, Hepler's Morning Edition. Owner, Little Flower Ventures, LLC, requested action, variances, one, from section 154.107 sub B to allow a lot width of 53 feet where 60 feet is required for lots with public water and sewer. And second, from section 154.107 sub C two to allow a side yard setback of five foot where six foot is required for lots having an area of less than 12,000 square feet for a proposed six lot subdivision. Zoning R single family district, county. Okay. Shelly, can you click on there? Thank you. Okay, this is Ryan Fellows, Area Planning Commission staff. On July 8th, 2020, the Area Board of Zoning Appeals denied two variances for a similar proposal, specifically from the minimum required lot width of 60 feet to 40 feet, and from the proposed required side setback of six feet to four feet, which was revised to five feet. The table and the staff comments uh, provides a comparison between the August of 2020 petition and the January of 2022 petition, this one. This current slide shows the petition area, which is northeast of Twinkingham Drive and Beulah Road. And zooming in, uh, these lots are northeast of Burdett and Bailey Avenue. The subject property is located in Hepler's Morningside Edition subdivision, which was platted in 1936. Lot widths in the original plat range from 40 feet, 80 feet, and 132 feet. The half block fronting Bailey Avenue, where the subject property is located between Burdett Street and Willis Avenue, was originally planted with seven lots. If the proposed development is approved, it would result in eight lots for this half block. Under the current zoning ordinance standards, this block could be developed with 10 lots if it's served by public water and sewer, which this development will be. Therefore, the density 
is consistent with what is allowed by right under the current zoning ordinance. Here is the property looking northeast from Bailey Avenue. In comparison, the City of South Bend zoning ordinance most equivalent to the county's R single family district is S1 suburban district, which requires a minimum lot width of 40 feet and a minimum side setback of five feet. The proposed development is consistent with those standards. On the slides is a property uh, looking along uh, Bailey Avenue to the west, along, west along Bailey Avenue. The Morningside Neighborhood Land Use and Pedestrian Plan was approved in 2014. The subject property is located in sub area four of this plan. The land use plan for this sub area states, it is recommended that development patterns in this sub area generally remain consistent with the current land uses and that this sub area retain its character as a predominantly single family residential neighborhood with limited institutional uses and moderate density single family residential that would not require extensive public investment receiving close scrutiny, end quote. I just moved the slide to the next one, which has the property looking east along Bailey Avenue from Burdett Street. Stormwater management and driveway access will be reviewed by the county engineer as part of the subdivision review process, which is a separate process than what we're doing today. The site plan presented in August 2020 included garages accessed from an alley at the rear. This alley has since been vacated at the request of the petitioner. The current proposal includes three shared driveways to, share si to serve the six units with garages facing the street. Under state law, variances from development standards are determined based on three criteria. Number one, the approval will not be injurious to the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare of the community. Staff finds that approval of the variances will likely not be injurious to the public health, safety, morals, or general welfare. The proposed development is single family residential. The Morningside plan calls for predominantly single family uses in sub area four where this subject property is located. Criteria number two, the use and value of the area adjacent to the property included in the variance will not be affected in a substantially adverse manner. The proposed density is not dramatically different than the density of the original plat. Additionally, if this block were developed under the current zoning ordinance standards, a total of 10 lots would be allowed by right. Criteria number three, the strict application of the terms of this chapter would result in practical difficulties in the use of this property. The original plat for this area had lot widths ranging from 40 feet, 80 feet, 132 feet. If approved, the proposed development would result in eight total zoning lots on this half block. Density along this block would be consistent with what is allowed by right under the current zoning ordinance. Additionally, the need for the side yard setback variance is commiserate with the lot width need. Therefore, staff recommends approval of the requested variances. Variance number one, from section 154.092 subsection D to allow a front yard setback of 38 feet from the center line. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. I apologize. Uh, variance number one from section 154.107B 
to allow the lot width of 53 feet where 60 feet is required for lots with public water and sewer. And variance number two from section 154.107C2 to allow a side yard setback of five feet where six feet is required for lots having an area less than 12,000 square feet for the proposed six lot subdivision. And the, the staff recommendation is that these be approved subject to the condition that sidewalks are required, which in previous discussion with the developer, uh, the developer has agreed to. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And before we get into any questions, uh, I just would like to add additional information uh, for clarity, because I know that this came up at the last meeting and we've had some questions from the public. Oh, sorry, I'm Abby Wiles, I'm the Area Plan Commission Director. Aside from the specifics of the variances being requested today, which are lot width and setback variances, we've had a number of questions from the public regarding what's permitted for a single family use. And I just wanna remind everyone here, uh, the board members, public, what uh, the definition of family is in the zoning ordinance and what would be allowed under the current ordinance. So the definition of family is one or more persons related by blood, legal adoption or marriage, living and cooking together as a single housekeeping unit, exclusive of household servants, or a number of persons but not exceeding two persons who are not related by blood, legal adoption or marriage, living and cooking together as a single housekeeping unit. That shall be deemed to constitute a family. A person or persons residing with a family as here and above defined by reasons of placement by publicly licensed placement agency shall be considered a family. So this property is, uh, the, the subject property and all six of the lots would be zoned single family. And per the zoning ordinance uh, definition of family, that's what would be allowed within each of the six units. Okay. Anybody got any questions? No? Thanks. Petitioner's up and ready to go. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Mike Huber with Avon Marsh Consultants, 315 West Jefferson Boulevard, South Bend. Uh, thank you for your time and your consideration of our request uh, this afternoon. I recognize a number of you from uh, being uh, around last summer when we brought this originally. Um, some of you are new, and, and so I'll quickly try to, um, I think staff has done an excellent job of kind of outlining uh, the, the uh, project request and, and the goals and, and the, um, and, and the, and uh, some of the issues we're dealing with this afternoon. Um, but I'm here representing Little Flower uh, Ventures and Brian Jafrida, who's a partner in Little Flower Ventures, uh, is here with me this afternoon. I know their other partner, uh, the Dimples are on in Zoom via as well. Um, to, to briefly put it, um, Mr. Jafrida is uh, acquiring the, the lot at the corner of uh, Bailey and um, Burdett, and he's building his own personal home there. Um, as Little Ventures partners, the Dimples actually own and um, maintain the house to the north of that uh, on Burdett Street too as well. So the partners are both neighbors and invested in this neighborhood. Um, and they saw the opportunity, this is a former memory care facility. Um, they saw the opportunity to acquire the rest of that property as a way to develop it themselves and protect their investments in their personal homes that they've built on Burdett. Um, and so their plan was originally to try to um, develop single family resident, so residential subdivision behind their homes um, originally, we were in the eight, seven, eight lot range. Um, we've reduced that down to six. Um, if you're gonna talk about differences from the plan we have today versus the plan we have um, had last year, we've reduced it further from seven to six lots. We've maintained all of the uh, design standards and all of the guidelines. We worked really diligently with city and county in between our two BZA meetings uh, um, last summer uh, to make sure that the, the development and the subdivision reflected uh, the goals of the Morningside Neighborhood Plan, which was developed that we were introduced to as we were going through this process, um, as well as the, the, the um, meeting the, the standards of the city county planning and city county engineering um, as well. So um, that's the shared driveway access came from county engineering. They'd like to see three curb cuts on Bailey for serving the houses as opposed to six, um, you know, uh, and, and, and things like that. And so um, additionally, we have developed uh, a, a home design that we think more accurately reflects what the city saw in terms of character. We, we do not have access to the alley. The alley was closed. Uh, it was never our intent, even previously, to serve 
the homes from the alley. We were gonna have garages in behind that were accessed from the street. Um, but uh, in terms of trying to limit pervious cover and, uh, and accommodate better drainage, um, we, we're, we are orienting the garages toward the street. However, they're 50% or less of the, of, the, uh, of the facade of the home and they're even or pushed back from the porch. So they're not sticking out and we don't have the concerns of a wall of garages as was I think previously, um, con con was a previous concern. Um, it, it, <clears throat> we are asking for a seven foot variance for the lot widths. Uh, we are asking to be consistent with the city standards in terms of the five foot side yard setbacks. Uh, we think those are, are um, adequate to, to protect the safety of the neighborhood. Um, I'd, I'd like to maintain that um, we, we, after some significant discussions with the city and a policy change that they decided to honor some previous commitments, we are still able to serve this project with water and sewer. Um, our clients will be uh, expending the resources to bring the water and sewer into the neighborhood um, as well. Um, the, the primary concerns that we heard from the neighborhood um, when we were here last, when we were here last summer, uh, related to concerns about uh, unrelated individual student, the the properties being uh, maintained and used as student rental housing, and uh, our our client's intention is to sell these uh, properties as single family homes, and so th they're not going to maintain them. They're not going to rent them out to students, um, and we you know when we were here last when we were here last summer, there was a um, a request to add additional written commitments. Um, restricting the who could live in those homes specifically related to student housing. And I think Abby summarized um, our contention that at that time and the contention we still maintain is that um, that, written, that written commitment is actually redundant because it's covered under what's covered in the, in the county zoning ordinance. We understand county is, doing, is uh, actually starting a new code enforcement program. So I think the county will actually have additional resources they could put forward to actually enforcing those codes in, if it were to become an issue in this case. Um, additionally, when we were here last summer and we were talking about written commitments, um, there was some discussion around how we would actually define student or who would be restricted from living in, those, in these homes. And I'd like to just point out that, that there would need to be some intention and clarity in creating that definition that, so that it may not impact the ability of our clients to at some point um, be able to sell their home or reduce the value of the price they could sell that home for because they are intending to sell these as single family homes and, and, uh, and the addition of written commitments that maybe are um, unclear or, 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 or uh, easily misunderstood might have a negative impact on their ability to do so. Um, so I think that covers pretty much what uh, I wanted to talk about. I know Mr. Jafrida uh, is anxious to also talk a little bit about um, bring his, his name and his face, he was over the phone last year, um, and tell you in his own words kind of what he's expecting in terms of uh, the development as well. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'd uh, like to start by thanking you for hearing our petition. I need your, and, name, and, your oh, name and address. I'm sorry. Uh, Brian Jafrida. Uh, 54196 Burdett Street, South Bend. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you for our, hearing our petition. Um, actually, I'd like to start with my name and address, I guess. Our petition was originally heard by this board in July of 2020, more than a year and a half ago. Since that time, there has been significant change that makes the project of extremely high value to both the county and the Morningside neighborhood. When we originally approached the BZA for this variance, access to the city utilities for county projects was common practice. Under that assumption, we proposed a seven lot subdivision consistent with county and city standards for lot service by municipal sewer services. Since that time, the city has changed its policy on supporting county project with city utilities. The city standard is simple. If the proposed project is on land subject to annexation, they will support it with city utilities. If it is not in the city's annexation plan or has no potential for future annexation, the city will not provide city utilities. There are many firms in mid-development that are learning or have learned that the city is holding religion around this new policy. Under the city's new policy, the Morningside neighborhood will not have access to city sewer. With the land that is majority controlled by the university, who has no motivation to accept proposed annexation, the Morningside neighborhood would never enjoy the benefit of city sewer services. In an older neighborhood like Morning, the Morningside neighborhood, this means two things. One, 
Aging septic systems can only be addressed through replacement with new septic systems, which are neither environmentally friendly or cost effective. And two, land values are artificially depressed because neighbors cannot subdivide their lots due to the area required to support a septic system. These properties are far less valuable for the neighbors than they would be if they could be subdivided and sold to separate lots, or if they could be used to attract small developers like us who would pay a premium for that land, knowing that it could be monetized over several units. Over much of the time that has elapsed since our last appearance in front of the BZA, we have been pursuing an exception to this policy to support our development. Months of effort and multiple meetings with every level of city planning and city engineering was invested in the pursuit of utilities for this project. Ultimately, it was the mayor himself that decided we should be granted access, the, granted the access we were requesting because the property purchase and the subsequent investments we made to cooperate with the city and county's demands were done under the assumption that we would be granted access to the utilities that serviced the nursing home that had occupied the site we purchased. The city is requiring us to undertake considerable expense to upgrade all of that infrastructure to meet the city's current standards. But based on a set of circumstances that are unique to us, as Little Flower Ventures and the owner of the previous Morningside uh, nursing care facilities, we have been granted this valuable exception that will not only benefit us, but all of the Morningside neighborhood and the neighbors in the Morningside neighborhood. Now, in order for a variance from, that, from the development standards of the zoning ordinance to be granted, the Area Board of Zoning Appeals must consider and determine that all required criteria of Indiana State Code are met. In this case we, case, we are not only meeting, but greatly exceeding these criteria. The approval will not, number one, the approval will not be injurious to the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare of the community. Our plans have been reviewed by the city and county planning and engineering, and all of their concerns and issues have been addressed in the petition put before the board today. Beyond meeting the simple standard of not being injurious to the public health, safety, and morals of the community, the municipal sewer that we are uniquely positioned to introduce to the Morningside neighborhood will have an immeasurably positive impact on the general welfare of the Morningside community. Two. The use and value of the area adjacent to the property included in the variance will not be affected in a substantially adverse manner. Please remember what we have stated multiple times. This property is being developed by the owners of the adjacent property to preserve and hopefully increase its value. We believe that the current proposed density, the quality and style of the proposed single family residences, our conscientious adherence to the guidance and standards of both the county and the city, and perhaps most importantly, the introduction of city sewer services not only meets the simple standard of not affecting in a substantially adverse manner, but in fact exceeds the standard by affecting the adjacent area in an immeasurably positive way. Number three, the strict application of the terms of the zoning ordinance will result in practical difficulties in Excuse the use. Excuse me, uh, Chairperson, the 10 minutes allotted for the petitioner's presentation has uh, been used up. They do have another five minute period to speak after the public hearing, but the 10 minute initial presentation time is up. Okay, so you got 10 minutes. I forgot to set my stopwatch, so I apologize. So. Okay, I'm uh, sorry, I was unaware. You're good. Um, okay. Can I finish or we, do you want us to? Unfortunately, you gotta be done. Okay. So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a couple questions for the petitioner. Okay. So you're the developer of all of these lots, correct? You and your partner? Yes. Um, as the de developers, you'll be the ones doing the building, the subdividing, the, de the building, and everything, or you're selling the lot to be built um, upon? No, we're going to develop the lots. Okay, so you're going to build everything, and then you're going to sell a completed home to somebody? Yes. Okay. And, and you're going to maintain your residence in that location where you're at currently? Yes. Our, look, our motivation was simple. My father sat where... DJ is sitting for 26 years of my life, and we were interrupted at all hours of the day or night by people petitioning my father as the commissioner of the Planning and Zoning Commission where I lived for things. And he would say it's simple. If it meets the, the criteria, I have to pass it. If it doesn't, I have to deny it. And if it's somewhere in the middle, he said, but there's always an easy answer to solving the problem and protecting the value of your land. Buy the adjacent property and develop it yourself. So that was the simple litmus test that we used to, to do this. We had the opportunity to buy the Morningside. It gave me not only the half acre I wanted for my personal residence, but it gave us the additional land surrounding my personal residence to ensure that it was developed to my standards, maintained to my standards, and basically sold to the people that, you know, 
are, gonna, are going to maintain the value and or increase the value of my property. And then just one other question I had, and this may be actually for staff as well too, is so if, 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 if they were to do a, a subdivision that not, would not require any type of variances, there would probably be room for four lots, is that correct, in addition to the existing house that they already have on there? Four or five? Five lots would be allowed? Five, five lots would be allowed, okay. So if they wanted to, if they, if, if, if they stuck to what the, what the uh, ordinance reads, which is 60 foot, they would be allowed five lots in this particular spot. Okay. That's what I wanted clarification on. Thanks. Could you share with us where the original connection for sewer and water is going to be located, where you're going to start from? So um, city water and sewer were brought to that location to service the old nursing home. Water is still there. The sewer was, uh, the nursing home was supported by a private lift station, and the city does not want to support private lift stations. They asked us to remove that when we demolished the nursing home, which we did for the benefit of the neighbors, because they, you know, we did not come at this without having met with all the neighbors prior to making these investments and moving forward, okay? And all the neighbors at the time suggested they did not like the eyesore and the dilapidation that was occurring on that property. First thing we did was we demolished it, and in conjunction with that, followed the city's guidance that the existing lift station should be removed. Um, so, be, because they were, yes, they would support us, but it was gonna have to be through gravity-fed sewer. We hired Evan Marsh. They did a study to prove that gravity-fed sewer could be brought from Douglas, which is the origination, down to the property. In fact, they, the city asked us to spend more money with Evan Marsh to, to see just how far down Burdett that uh, sewer could be extended to see if it could cover the entire Morningside neighborhood. So we spent more money to support the city's interest in the gravity-fed sewer to support the Morningside neighborhood. This is prior to their new policy. And we hired Avon Marsh. So we undertook two studies to prove that we could support the entire Morningside neighborhood with the, with the, um, the sewer that we're going to bring down from Douglas. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? You guys are donors. I'm not. Is it normal to not include the finished basement in the square footage? It's, it's not included unless there's an egress. Unless there's an egress, that's correct, yeah. There's two egresses. Yeah, so, it, but it says unfinished. Yeah. No, it says basement finished area. It says future, future office, future office, future rec room. If you look at it, total finished area is 3,211 square feet. And basement. right underneath it says basement finished area 11, 11. That's when it is finished, yeah, when it is finished. Right. And I was noticing that with two egresses and five bedrooms, six bedrooms, five bedrooms, it could be a seven bedroom house. And there's two laundries in there, one on the main floor, one on the second floor. And there's like five bathrooms. I don't build houses. I mean, it's... it's Is that a normal again. house? Five. Seven Wait bedrooms, till you see possibly? the house I'm building. I'm, yeah. I'm asking. I don't I mean, know. it's a big house. It's... Uh, but Do it's, you usually have one room and two floors? You want me to keep answering these questions? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I am in this house. You are in this house? Okay. Mm. If you see some of the new houses going up in my neighborhood, yeah, I mean, it's, they're, they're okay. massive. I don't know. I can't believe they're building a house that big. I wonder how many kids they have. I fear it. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think what you're getting at is you're worried about the well, I think rental? Or I the, think they're going to rent rooms out just because I don't have no use for seven bedrooms, possibly, five bathrooms, two laundries. I'm just saying what I see. I don't know, man. You should see some of these houses. It's a big house, so. Yeah, we're not a petitioner. Anybody? No. Anybody else? I'm anything? asking the builders. Okay. Well, Anybody he's the developer. Anything? He's the one developing the house, so maybe he can answer the question. Well, he should, yeah. But I'm asking a normal builders. Oh, a normal builder. Understood. Normal. Is this a normal house? For today, you're saying for today can be for today. Okay, I just wanted to know. I have no idea. All right. I anybody got anything. anybody else got any questions? Abby, you got something you want to say? 
No, I was just going to suggest that you ask the petitioner or move on to the public hearing. Yeah, that's what I was getting yeah. ready to do. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, is there anybody here in favor of this petition <coughs> in house or on Zoom? No? No one on Zoom. All right, anybody against this petition? Yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Sh Mr. Sharon just raised oh. his hand. Is it four? We do have there he is. Yeah, we have somebody on Zoom, so give us one second, sir. No problem. Can you hear us, Mr. Sharon? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Dave. Um, Dave Sharon, fire marshal with Clay Fire, 18355 Auten Road, South Bend. Um, speaking in opposition to variance number two, the side yard setback because obviously the five foot uh, will allow for inadequate space for the application of our ground ladders in case of a fire, the ladders that we normally raise at, uh, at structures that are greater than one story uh, requires at least six feet of the base of it to be back from the structure. And we know that once, uh, obviously with a five foot setback and once privacy fence will be added and landscaping that will be down to two or three feet from the building. Uh, the, uh, our issue in regards to that is, is uh, you know, two answers. One, redesign down to the, the five lot project, keep your first variance uh, to the 53 feet, and then you'll end up having adequate space for the, the setbacks or install residential fire sprinklers in those buildings, which will be uh, not only providing life safety for the residents, but it also provide them in excess of 20% savings of homeowners insurance. So they would be able to recoup the cost of that, which generally is on new construction is between 1% of the total cost and two and a half percent of the total cost of the house. Dave? Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody got questions? No. All right. Thanks, sir. Uh, you're here as well. Name and address, please. Thank you. My name is Peter J. Agostino. I'm an attorney at law with offices at 131 South Taylor Street. I'm also the assistant county attorney. I'm here to speak on behalf of uh, Lisa and Mike Dobson, who are also here. They reside at 54165 Willis, very close to the uh, development site. Uh, last time I was here to speak in opposition to this, I provided uh, the board there a statute which tells you that you can require commitments to be made in connection with these developments. You have that power. I think you still have that statute. I think Ms. Ecker can confirm that for you. Um, also presented to you today was a copy of a written commitment that was uh, entered in a neighborhood near this, which is designed to limit and prevent student rental housing. Uh, I also submitted four different types of commitments to the board uh, to limit this or prevent the use of uh, student housing um, in this area. Uh, there's nothing that prohibits a limitation on student housing. Uh, the concern here is, and I think Mr. Schaefer picked up on this, if you look at the floor plan and design uh, of this uh, develop, uh, the houses that are proposed, four beds, uh, in two pairs with a bathroom between on the se second floor. Uh, basement is set up to put two more bedrooms in there because of the egress windows with the bathroom and, and the two laundries. This is a very similar floor plan to what's used up at University Edge Apartments right next to campus. I'm familiar with that because I represent the town of Roseland and oversaw their zoning of applications up there. So there are uh, issues and concerns with this. I've also represented many developers. There's nothing unusual with requesting a commitment. And when I represented developers that are from this area, and when they tell you that I'm not going to rent this to students, they're willing to look you in the eye and they're willing to say, I'll make a written commitment to that. That's what's enforceable. The problem we have with the, limiting this to the definition of family under the county code is that 
four, five, six kids living together that are unrelated might call themselves a family. That's why we need further specificity here, further limitation. You all have a picture here of what happens at Legacy Village, right down the street, the parties. That's not good for the public safety and morals of the neighborhood. Safety of the neighborhood is a concern. You ought to consider what the neighbors in that neighborhood consider. We're not opposed to the project. We simply, uh, with, uh, as single family, except for we want that commitment in writing. We want that commitment in writing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else against it? Good afternoon, my name is Mike Dobson. I reside at 54165 Willis Street. Uh, we are the property to the northeast of the proposed development. As uh, Pete indicated, we're not uh, unfavorable to the single family development. And when we say single family development, it is what both Ryan and Abby Wiles had both specificated. But when I look at the layouts of the houses, uh, I'm not sure that that is the case. And as Pete indicated, and when we were here last time, all we ask is a commitment by the developer that these will stay as single family and not have student housing. While he indicates he's building his home to the west of this development, that isn't going to be his primary home. My primary home is to the northeast of this development. Thank you very much. I'm not going to talk again. Just kidding. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, this is, I have my hand up. This is uh, Tim Sexton, University of Notre Dame. Is it okay if I chime in now? Yes, sir. Name and Thank you very much. Tim Sexton with offices 405 Main Building, University of Notre Dame. Uh, we are a major property owner uh, of this area, as it was articulated earlier. We, uh, as well, do not have an issue as far as the, uh, this, this particular development, but are concerned relative to the student housing component and would voice our support of what was articulated by Mr. Agostino um, uh, two people ago and uh, would strongly encourage the board to encourage the developer to have some written commitment in that regard. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Richard Lindsay. I live at uh, 18340 Buller Road in Morningside, or as we call it, Dog Patch. Um, I'm a fourth generation resident. My daughters are the fifth. My grandfather and his brothers built most of those homes in the neighborhood. Um, and I'm all for the progress and improving of our neighborhood. Um, as long as we're talking single family dwellings um, and not multifamily, AKA student housing, which I'm totally against. Um, years back, the zoning was changed uh, to single family for every property north of Dunn to the Warren course, uh, to campus on the west, Ironwood on the east. Um, and my family used to own seven homes in there that we used as student housing, but uh, we followed the guidelines, and of course, we lived amongst those while they were uh, rentals, and we didn't come six games a year. Um, um, with that being said, uh, basically, I just want to say uh, I'm totally in favor of the single family dwellings that would increase, increase the property values of myself, my neighbors, and everybody in Dog Patch. Um, but I just don't want to see student housing like Legacy Village, where I go to Little Flower Church, and if you go through the parking lot there on Sunday mornings, it's, it's a mess. I mean, uh, I just don't want to see that in my neighborhood. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else against? We have somebody on Zoom. 
Uh, hello, my name is Andy Castelli, president of the St. Trophy County Board of Commissioners, with offices on the uh, seventh floor of the County City Building. I just wanted to, to add that I'm, I'm not against the project per se, but I do think one of the things that we, we look at from a county standpoint is we want to make sure that we maintain a certain level um, of housing because we need more single-family housing across the county. Uh, we certainly do. Uh, and it certainly improves quality of life and, and helps keep, help us attract more people to the community. That said, we do want to have the fine line of student housing with um, single-family housing. And we, they've identified the university, done a fantastic job of identifying, of identifying and putting student housing um, opportunities adjacent to the campus. But what we are trying to avoid is the sprawl as it goes into to, uh, more residential neighborhoods. So I think anything we could do to help limit that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know who that was speaking? I didn't pick up on that. That was Commissioner Castelli. Oh, was it Stone. Andy? <clears throat> yes, sir. My name is Tom Sullivan. I live at 54278 Ivy Road. I've lived there since uh, we moved from New York in 2012. I want to second uh, the idea of no student housing, and I'm concerned. If the intent is not to have student housing, and if the intent is to sell it and make a profit, which they're entitled to, and they should have, I don't see the harm in having what I would call a restrictive covenant, I guess is a different term here, put in and record it, because that's the intent they say. We don't intend, well then just co confirm it. That's like me coming to you and saying, hey, I don't intend to do something, and you say, but maybe you're gonna sell it. Would you put it in writing? If that's my intent, I will sign that, give it to you, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Somebody else on Zoom? Yeah. We're going to close out the public portion here. All right. Mr. Chair, I want to add for the record that uh, we did not receive any letters or emails beforehand, but there were five email, I'm sorry, five letters that were passed out before the meeting. The letters were the same, but the signatures were different. Uh, I just wanted to add that for the record. And I uh, received two phone calls of inquiry. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up on that. And as a reminder, the petitioner does have a five-minute rebuttal period if they want to use that. Okay. You move that to them now or after yes. we talk? It All would right. be now. So I can give you five more minutes if you got something that you want to address uh, with what was said. <coughs> Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to <coughs> readdress the board. Um, I'd like to point out that the last meeting, as this meeting, um, on this petition de devolved from a discussion about our project's adherence to the variance criteria into a referendum on our morality. And I, I, I feel a little frustrated that that's where we are again, that what's being questioned is what I'm standing here in front of you as a homeowner in the neighborhood uh, presenting. I, I understand people have been burned. I understand they've got concerns. But the, opposition, the opposition had one concern, student rentals, and asked the county to require ground restrictions on our property to ensure that we could not rent the property to students. Ground restrictions, I might add, that would only be applied to our property, but not the properties of those demanding it. While we understand our neighbors' concerns, and we have worked to, to hear them, and we have worked to meet them, and we have spent money on meeting them, it must be emphasized that we not only understand, but share those concerns as property owners in the neighborhood. Both families involved in this project will have personal residences on the adjoining lots to our proposed development. This is not Legacy Village, where the owners are an Illinois LLC. This is Brian Jafrida and Sharon Jafrida and John and Jackie Dimple, who are property owners at 54196 and 54190 Burdett Street. In all the remonstrances by a small, set of, small subset of the neighborhood, it was lost that this project is not a cash grab by a foreign entity that will destroy the value of the neighborhood, but an investment by neighbors to protect and increase the value of the neighborhood. This is substantially different than Legacy Village. That was 
a foreign entity looking for a cash grab. This is neighbors looking to invest and protect the value of their own properties. The opposition held and still holds that our resistance to the ground restriction was an indication of our intent to use the property for student rentals. What was not known or perhaps just not shared by those making this demand is that ground restrictions have a severe negative impact on the value of a property. Several proxies exist in the exact area of our proposed project that show that time on market was nearly doubled and the selling price was reduced by more than 40% when restrictions of any kind were placed on the underlying land. While we understand the covenants will make the neighbors rest assured of our intentions, the neighbors and the board need to understand that those restrictions neutralize the economics that will enable the valuable infrastructure that benefits both the county and the very same neighbors that are, that are asking for the ground restrictions. We have accommodated the county, the city, and the neighbors unwaveringly through this entire process, which is more than two years now, by reducing the proposed density from eight to six and by re-architecting both the site and the proposed houses to meet the demands of the neighbors, the county, and the city. Meeting all of the demands and requests that were placed on us has already hampered our ability to defray the $300,000 cost of bringing the municipal, municipal sewer to the Morningside neighborhood. Denying this variance and further reducing the property count from six to five and or imposing ground restrictions that reduce the property value by nearly half scuttles the project that will have immense value to the neighbors who would be able to enjoy municipal services, sewer services, who would be able to replace aging septic systems with more cost-effective and environmentally friendly uh, uh, public sewer access and potentially subdivide their own properties when the lot size requirements for septic systems is removed. We are substantially increasing the value of every homeowner in that area by bringing that sewer in and allowing them to subdivide their properties for their own personal gain, either now or in the future. I would ask the board to consider three things when making this decision. The project's adherence to the criteria for granting variances. We are greatly and positively impacting the general welfare of the neighborhood and we are, a, are positively impacting not only the properties adjacent to the project, but the entire Morningside neighborhood by being in the unique position to obtain and fund municipal services for the entire area. The efforts we have made to, number two, the efforts that we have made to cooperate with and remain sensitive to all the issues raised by the county, the city, and the neighbors. We have voluntarily brought our requested subdivision from eight units to six and made multiple costly changes to both the site and house plans to meet the wishes and concerns of everyone and made a host of investments to ensure that the work we're doing will enhance the value of the neighborhood both short and long term. After all, we are neighbors seconds. of the project. 20 seconds. The technical merit of the, of the arguments from both sides. Okay, we are building, a, pro proposing a modest seven foot variance to a four room for a six family, uh, six family, single family residence that will be consistent with current zoning, adheres to the requests and requirements of the county, the city and the neighbors, greatly exceeds the criteria for variances and will help defray the cost of a $300,000 infrastructure investment that benefits everybody in the dog patch. I'm gonna stop you there. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate the time and the opportunity to be here. Okay. I had a question. I don't know who to ask it to. But if this is a seven bedroom house, yes. I got a three bedroom house, I got three cars, where do they park them? Public street, they park on the street. Is it legal to park on county roads? Can I, can I address your concerns about the houses? Because you brought it up twice right. now and I haven't had a chance to answer. Sir, you can answer the questions uh, brought to or asked by the board members, but not introduce any new material. Okay. So you could answer the question of where parking. the vehicles will be parked. Yeah, I was just asking where well, legal parking was to these, you know, in the county. You really can't park on a county road. You can. You can. Mm -hmm. You can, but good luck if you don't get hit. Yeah. You know. You can. Okay. I, I'd like to answer your question about the houses, because yeah. I, I, I <coughs> no. I'd pump okay. the brakes and okay. just answer the questions that he's that he's going to ask. Yeah, I, I believe that the parking that we have uh, accom have built and accommodate will accommodate the actual use of the seven rooms of the house, which are being labeled as bedrooms, but are commonly, from where I come from, converted into studies 
in home offices, especially with COVID, a lot of people looking for additional space for in home officing, uh, uh, in home work and fitness uh, workout and fitness facilities. That's what extra bedrooms are used where w me and the dimples come from. Anybody else got any questions? <laughs> no? Well, I, I, I will. I mean, you, do you mean for the petitioner or just our, our general our general talk for the petitioner? No, I don't have a question. Okay. All right. Thanks, sir. Thank you. All right. I, I wanted to go back to what Dave Sharon said. Did I misinterpret what he was saying that he, he suggested reducing it to five units rather because he wanted more space he there? He wanted more space between the, the units for the ladders to go up to the second floor. For fire protection. Yeah, yeah. fire protection, that's correct. Yeah. He said he needs it six feet. Yeah. Yeah, whatever the minimum is, which is six. Yeah. Side door, no, side door setback is, is, yeah, six. They're asking for five. They need the six because if there's a fence there, they can't get the, the two-story ladder up then. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Right. But you have windows in front and back, too, that hit the same rooms. That was Mr. Schroen's contention. Yeah. I, I, this is a, I don't know. I have just general questions for just, I guess, more philosophical. I mean, you drop one lot, they do whatever the hell they want to. No commitments, no nothing, no nothing required. If they only build five on this lot, which is legal without any issues. <clears throat> As a homeowner, I moved, I moved into a subdivision that has a non operational homeowner association that has covenants and restrictions so no one does anything. Randy down the street puts whatever the hell he wants to out on his lawn in the morning and doesn't really care about what anybody says about it because there's no, there are county ordinances that aren't enforced right now. Actually, no, I'm in town of Osceola, so they, they have their own code, uh, code enforcement. Um, how are we going to, how would commitments be regulated? How are they going to be enforced? How are, and why would, why would, I didn't hear any of the people that were against this petition come up and say they would subject themselves to the same commitments as well too. Did I miss anyone saying that? No. Nope. Nope. Okay. So why would we restrict somebody that's developing land with their own money to a commitment that no one else around them has to make that commitment to? And that's more rhetorical question. I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just stating where I'm coming from. <clears throat> I understand the concern. But believe me, I have relatives that live in, not dog patch, nor dog patch, that their next door neighbor behind them, every home Saturday game is party central and they move out of their house for the weekend because they don't have to deal with it. It's a tough time. Um, but we're not here to litigate what may or may not happen, potentially. We can go by with what the petitioner has asked us. And even if they don't get what they're asking today, they can still build five houses that could have the same or more issues in the long run. That's true. So, And then they wouldn't even have to probably bring in the Sewer and water? I think they would just because they already invest. They already got well, some costs in the sewer. They're going to pay to have it, especially if, if Mayor Mueller has told them that he would do it for them. Then I'm guessing that they're, yeah. they're going to take advantage because it makes it, again, it makes it more of a attractive, attractive property. Right, yeah. And that's the whole point of, of land. If you own it, you want to make sure that it's valued at what it should be valued for. I owned a piece of property up in, on Eagle Lake in Michigan that was actually a residential house on a, on a commercially zoned lot. Guess what I got for it? Squat because it can't be added onto. It couldn't do anything with it. So, a house right next to it went for four hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. That house went for ninety thousand dollars. So, that goes to where the restrictions from what either commitments or anything that's already in the ordinances come to effect in, in being developed. If this suggestion was happening in Miami Hills, would it be the same story or a different story? If it was happening in your backyard, would it be the same story or a different story? Yeah. Personally, I think it'd be a good thing. So why is where it's at make the difference? Right. Okay. Does anybody else got anything? No? Then I'll take and a I'm, motion. I'm just saying my opinion. I'm welcome to differing opinions to convince me something different. I'll take a motion whenever anybody wants. So we have two variances, correct, that we have to... I would make a motion to accept the variances as requested by the petitioner with no commitments in hand. You want to keep the subject to a sidewalk? I'm sorry. Yes. Subject to sidewalks being built per the staff recommendations. Thank you. 
Thank you for reminding me. Second. I second. I second. You second? We have a motion and a second. Shelley? Mr. Hawley? Yes. Mr. Ritzma? <clears throat> no. Mr. Schaefer? No. Mr. Veldman? Yes. Mr. Moffat? Yes. Mr. Tavernier? No. So, motion did not pass. That motion failed. Motion failed. So, the next would be a motion in the opposite direction. So it would be a motion to deny the variances if someone would like to make that. Or? Or you could choose to table it, I suppose. Or could someone make a motion with some sort of commitment to it? With a yeah, you could make you could remake a motion to if somebody has a better idea commitment if you want them. So, from staff's perspective, I will just chime in about the commitments. Some of the commitments proposed by Mr. Augustino, um, I had asked Brandy to review those prior to the meeting because I had some concerns. Uh, because students themselves aren't a protected class, but implications for the Fair Housing Act. And it could potentially be problematic. So students are not a protected class under state law or federal law. There's a possibility, depending on the age of the students, that familial status protections could come into play, depending on how young they were. Because familial status protects uh, discrimination based on Age, based on whether you have a child in the house, which would be somebody under the age of 18. And Indiana defines as family to include one person by themselves. So theoretically, you could have a situation where a student wanted to live in the, one of these houses that happened to be under the age of 18 and they wouldn't be able to if you prohibited student housing per se. Um, but students as a class themselves are not protected. Uh, my concern on that was more about if you designate a specific class of people, that tends to be more lawsuit bait even if you are going to win. People would be more likely to challenge something that designates a specific class of people to be disfavored, in my opinion, even if the county were to win on that. It would be a frivolous lawsuit that the county would have to spend money to defend. However, Mr. Augustino has included uh, commitments from a, another petition, one of which is a restriction on renting, leasing, or subleasing. Which just general no lease provisions have been found in a couple of different cases I found to not be violative of the Fair Housing Act. So, because they don't, pick, they don't pick on a class of people and say you can't rent here. It just says anybody who owns the property is not allowed to lease. If that's a restriction you feel is appropriate to put on the property owners, that's up to you, but I don't necessarily see a legal problem with that one. Well, I mean, let's face it. Kids move into any of these houses, this subdivision is going to be, like, watched like a hawk now, so. I didn't hear what you said. What did you say? I said if anybody moves into this other than a, a, a family, I mean, this subdivision is going to be all over this thing. The the surrounding houses are yeah, gonna be all over this thing now. They'll so, police themselves, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you can either petition another motion for the denial, correct? You can have a motion or, to deny in general, or you could make, somebody could make a motion to approve subject to whatever commitments that person feels like applying. So what, what are these for? These are their... Uh, I believe Mr. Augustino has submitted several different versions of uh, various suggestions oh, these didn't for come commitments. From, from the petitioner, this came from... Okay. No, they did not come from the petitioner. Gotcha. Um, I believe, working off my memory, I think one of the possible suggestions was of uh, limiting gatherings of some kind of parties to certain numbers. Um, and that particular one, if you decided to pick it and use it, <coughs> then I would say as your attorney, you would need to include an exception for First Amendment protected activities as a government body requiring that. Um, 
because if they were to have a gathering, it would be some kind of a political rally that would be protected under the First Amendment, and you can't stop them from doing that. Any commitments can be under, they can get through them. If, 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 if whoever is really wanting to be, again, you can't. I, to, to be clear, yes, the, the enforceability of, of being able to enforce most of the suggested commitments, um, gathering the required proof to be able to prove violations might be on the more difficult side. That's the thing that I've been dealing with in Mishawaka on something they want to pass about gatherings. I think people might have heard of this. Heidi, legislate behavior. This is a minority report where I'm going to arrest you because you're thinking about going to a party where you're not supposed to be at because it's not been sanctioned by the city of Mishawaka. But after the fact, I can do something about it. But this is the same thing here. I can't make a commitment for something that may or may not happen. There are things in place, the way the ordinances are written and the way things can be done. And like Sydney said, the neighborhood seems to be pretty self-policing on a lot of things. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the gentleman from Notre Dame, they own most of the stuff out there as well, too. 10 to 1 says Notre Dame Security Police police that as well out there, probably more than the St. Joe County Sheriff's or South Bend Police do. But Mr. Sexton, didn't he say That's he encouraged, uh, encouraged yeah. the petitioner to have a written to. commitment? Yeah. I'd be open to hearing what his commitment would be. What would, what would he want to commit someone to? If there's a written commitment to be done, wouldn't that be done by the petitioner well, anyway? They would have to be the one that would say they'd be willing to go against these commitments. So, Brandon, that's my question is, do we have to, like, how much detail do we have to go into, like, a written commitment? Like, isn't that up to the petitioner to, if we just generally say to have a written commitment or a covenant, it's up to the petitioner then to get that spelled out? Or are we spelling out X, Y, Z for what should be said in the written commitment? Uh, generally speaking, it would be preferable for you to be more specific as to what you want it to be, because if they are just going to propose language, it may not end up saying exactly what you intended. Um, without knowing what you are uh, get, driving at in terms of content, I'm not sure if I... I'm just trying to get an idea of, like, if I'm going to make a motion, how am I going to address it? I would say you want to be as specific as you can get as far as what you want it to say. So if that's the case, because obviously we've only had an hour and 10 minutes to digest all of this, if we were to table this for next month, is it allowed for the board to create a written commitment that they would like to see and have it passed to the petitioner through you and all that to see what would be agreeable or not agreeable? Um, I think that would be... May, may, may I address this? I'd have to ask our yeah, lieutenant to yeah. come back up, Ms. Grounds, you know. Yeah. Let me approach her and I'll get her to answer. If you have some time to think about it, work on it, and then come back next month. I think it'd be good as us as a board. I don't disagree. If we're the ones supposed to specify. That's, that was my question. Correct. No one, I, I haven't said anything. I mean, I'm not going to make somebody commit to something unless they're willing to make that commitment. I suppose that's true. If they'd reconfigure the house, they could probably move the others wide enough. I guess as a matter of clarification, Abby, again, uh, the enforceability of commitments was brought up. Enfor uh, excuse me. The zoning administrator, the BZA, the plan commission can enforce commitments. There was a comment made earlier about potentially code enforcement enforcing commitments. Code enforcement isn't being formed to enforce zoning commitments. They're being formed to enforce things like abandoned vehicles, overgrown grass, and um, public nuisance, so like trash That's and apart. litter. <laughs> I mean, correct? Abandoned vehicles, but not parking on grass. Okay. So the commitments will still be done by Sean Ryan. <laughs> the, the, the cops are Yes, <laughs> and you. Gotcha. I just want to make sure that that's known. That, thank you for the clarification, because, I mean, part of, I guess it's not a code violation, but, you know, a party that's not agreeable to the neighborhood would be nice. So if you wanted to, if you guys wanted to try to formulate a commitment here 
and have us transmit it to the developer and see what they think about it and come back and table it for a decision at the next meeting, you could do that. You could uh, table it and require the uh, developer to try to develop their own commitment and see what you think of it at the next meeting. That's what I was gonna say. Or you could try to oh, formulate one yourselves and decide that that's what you want okay. and do that. So we need a motion for that though, right? Any of those things would require a motion, yes. Okay, so somebody needs to make a motion for the developer. So I'll make a motion to table this petition, petition number two, till next month, pending a set of written commitments from the developer on how they plan to address the neighborhood's issues on student housing, rental issues, and potential party issues at these locations. Is that second. specific enough? Since you're re requiring them to formulate it themselves, I, it should be. Now, I'll I don't second. know what you're going to get from that, but. <laughs> well, we get what we get, but that's a starting point. Yes. Is that good enough? I'll second. All right, motion and a second. Mr. Hawley? Yes. Mr. Moffat? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Veldman? Yes. Mr. Ritzma? Yes. And Mr. Tavernier. Yes. So we've tabled this till next meeting and... And the developer has been directed by the board to submit a uh, proposed set of commitments addressing, I believe it was the student housing, leasing, and, pos and partying issues brought up by the neighborhood. Is that... You got it. Specific and ambiguous enough. Yeah. Good. Okay. Can we can we see that uh, be, uh, before uh, the meeting is held? I, I, it would be submitted. It would be given to you guys in your packet. Yeah. Okay. You get it It'll be in the packet. But I guess it okay. might need Thank you. It, so. I, I, you'll get all the same materials that you had here, plus whatever they submit for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Shelley, number three. All mm -hmm. right. Location six two nine eight eight Pine Road. Owners, Philip and Barbara Lee, requested action. Variance, one from section 154.092, sub D, to allow a front yard setback of 38 feet from the center line of the road where a minimum of 75 feet is required for a new attached garage. Zoning A, agriculture, agricultural district, county. Yeah, good afternoon. This is Sean Klein, Area Plan Commission staff. So the existing house that we're looking at here is set back approximately 38 feet from the center line of the road. Um, it is legal nonconforming. It was constructed prior to any uh, zoning ordinance or front setback regulations. They would like to add an attached garage in line with the existing front setback at the 35 or 38 feet rather. Um, Staff uh, would support a setback variance to allow it to be built at 45 feet. Uh, this was the recommendation from the county engineer. If it were any less than uh, 40 feet from the center line of the road, uh, this would place it within the right of way, should the right of way there ever be uh, dedicated. And it was the opinion of the county engineer that it would not be safe to allow new construction that close to the center line of the road. Uh, so when we turn to the criteria found in state law, um, staff finds that the approval would not be injurious to public health, uh, morals, or general welfare. Um, but per the uh, county engineer's recommendation, we feel that allowing the 38-foot setback uh, could be detrimental to public safety. Um, when we turn to the use and value of the area adjacent to the property, Included in the variance, uh, we find that it would not be affected in a substantially adverse manner, um, mainly because um, it would not have really any impact on adjacent agricultural uses, and uh, the residential uses to the south there are far enough removed from this house that the setback reduction really wouldn't have any impact there either. Um, additionally, we find that the strict application of the terms of this chapter would result in practical difficulties, um, given that the house is constructed at a 35 foot uh, or 38 foot setback from the center line of the road. 
So if they were to con have to construct the garage 75 feet back, then they obviously could not have an attached garage. Um, so we do find that there's adequate practical difficulty, that it would not adversely affect the area. Uh, but just uh, based on the recommendation of the county engineer and that uh, safety point, um, we can only recommend the 45 foot setback rather than the 38 requested. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I meant to ask this earlier. <laughs> Now's ahead. your time. Can you give me picture, please? This one? So does the 45 feet line up to the front of where that addition there is? So it'll still be um, it'll still be somewhat in front of where that addition is. So it'll kind of be a jog in front. Right. It would, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. So it'll be about ten ten and a half feet in front of it. Of that much. Yeah, so it's 38 feet from the... Oh, yeah, 38 feet this. to the front of the house. You're only asking for another basically seven feet. So, yeah, so that's Once. pretty good ways back. Yeah. Correct. <clears throat> okay. All right. Any other um, Petitioner, is that you? Uh, ter oh. Terry Lang from Lang, Feeney, Whiteman. Uh, the petition before you, as, as John had indicated, is an existing home that's a non-conforming use. The proposed garage addition, if you look at our site plan, uh, lines up the uh, new garage with the front of the existing home. Um, the safety factor that uh, the county engineering office has expressed here, the existing home is in its location already. So the safety factor for the existing home already exists. So lining up the garage with this new uh, the lining up the garage with the existing home creates no more of an impact than the existing home has already had there as a non-conforming use as you can see from the aerial map there it's agricultural ground in every direction uh north and in mostly to the south also so the impact is is minimal at best for uh, a hazard. Um, if the county is going to widen Pine Road, um, I don't see it happening in uh, the very near future. Uh, doesn't say that it, it won't. It is agriculturally zoned property. So it would entail quite a bit of uh, reconfiguring of the zoning map of this agricultural area. So to say that it's a, you know, a need for it to be back back further, the, the, the leaves are looking just to line up the house with their new garage to make it easier for the design and flow of the home. And that's a petition before you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Lane, do you have any idea of, sorry, I didn't mean to step on you. Do you have any idea, the, the roof line of the garage, proposed garage, is it going to follow the roof line of the lower section of the existing house or the roof line of the two-story addition? I don't know the roof lines of the house. I've just given the footprint of the proposed garage addition. Well, thank you for the answer. Does it matter? A little bit. Okay. All right. Um, I believe she's part of the petition as well. Okay. Ma'am, you need well, to come up and... and uh, <laughs> Can't give it up. <laughs> Name and address, please. Barbara Lee, 62988 Pine Road, North Liberty. I just was wondering, the way you're lining it up, are you just going to extend the roof line from like the existing structure that's there, the little small bump out, or are you going to have it go along the same way as the as the rest of the two-story uh, portion of the house? It's going to go where the, the, the taller part is. Okay. So it'll look the same kind of bookended. Yes. Is it as tall as that section as well, too, or is it a standard, like... No, it's going to be standard. Okay. Did you build this home originally? No. So you're, I believe our home is over 100 years old. You look great. Really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> we put a lot of money into that home. <laughs> That's right. 
But you never had a garage. There is actually a garage on the other side. That little rinky deep oh, yeah, one. I see it, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? No. Nope. All right. We'll open it up to uh, to the public. Anybody in favor? Zoom. Nope. Nope. All right. Anybody against? <coughs> Zoom. Nope. All right. Any questions? The reason I asked the question is because. If you push it back and the roof line is going to stay as the taller portion is, it would look funnier if it wasn't lined up realistically. In That's my true. opinion. In my opinion. If it was following the other roof line, then yes, it would look okay if it was pushed back because then it could line up in the middle. But if it's designed to go to the different roof line, then it makes a difference in the aesthetics. I think it creates a little goofy courtyard in between there anyways. Did you see the so design of the plans for the houses we were just looking at? I, I understand. So. <laughs> I, I get it. Hey, I don't. I, I'm not giving you the it's just tone. it's just a little little courtyard. Mm -hmm. that, so it could be a planting area. It could be hey, you like it? I love it. <laughs> Any questions? Did, did the staff? Uh, they recommended uh, approval. Approval. At 45, right? 45 feet. Yes. And that was based on comments from the county engineer. Yeah. From. Mr. Chairman, while I uh, appreciate the comments from, uh, from everyone involved about moving it back to 45 feet, the house is already at 38 feet. What are they going to do if they widen pine or they to go into the right-of-way? They're going to have to do something with the whole house anyway. So I would make a motion that we accept the variance as requested at 38 feet um, and let her make it look like a bookended home. I'll second that. Sid Schaefer. All right. Motion and a second. Shelley? Mr. Hallway? Yes. Mr. Moffat? Yes. Mr. Ritzma? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Vellman? Yes. Mr. Tavernier? Yes. Based on the testimony presented here today, the Area Board of Zoning and Appeals, after careful consideration, finds petition number three granted and will issue written findings of the facts. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thanks, Terry. Oh. Turn him down. Wow. Hearing. All right. <coughs> Thank you. I will make a motion that we accept the uh, finding of the facts as presented for the December 8th, 2021 meeting. Second. Who second that? And you don't need Was a roll call vote for these. You, you yeah. can just call uh, all in favor. I didn't hear what she said. He wanted to know who seconded it. Oh, okay. Mm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Minutes. Let's see. We got the minutes of the November. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the November 10th, 2021 ABZA meeting. Second. All, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Did you give a second? Yep. All right. Oh, okay. And I'll also make a motion to approve the minutes of the December 8, 2021 ABZA meeting, which is an invigorating read. You did a great job, Sydney. <laughs> Second that. Yeah. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All opposed? Aye. I'll make a motion to, well, no. I, so what do we need to do for this commitment thing? What do you need from us, if anything? Well, right now, nothing. You told the developer to do all the Developer needs to do it. Okay. We'll reach out to them and let them know when they need to have their draft, if any, to us in order to make the packet. Well, I won't be here next month, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I did. I'm, I'm muted the same way you're not here next month. I do, but, so, all right, so, and I'm not sure if this is speaking out of turn, and we can, we, I, may, I can make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Well, I did, I did uh, Abby, do you have a start? N no other business, no other gentlemen, business. nope. Okay, thanks, Randy. All right. <laughs> Motion first uh, or second? Mr. Moffat. He seconded. Mr. Schaefer seconded. All right. Oh. All in favor? Aye. 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 All, well, nobody's going to oppose it. Well, all opposed? You weren't going to get a, you probably weren't going to get a motion on that, so that's why I went the, the harsh route. What? With the commitments on <clears> your <throat> two. I, 
I, I was going to put a motion so together. Things that I wanted to say, but I got questioned. I wasn't planning on doing this today. <laughs> so I didn't you know. know what I could, Mr. Schaefer, Mr. Velman. Like, I didn't know what right. I could. I was gonna, like, what can I say? What I can't do. I was getting ready to do something. I was trying to figure out what that was gonna be. I'll need your signature, Mr. Sydney. Right. Correct. Powerful and what? And surprisingly limited. Yeah, because I had. Well, no, but I wanted to make. I wanted to make a motion for something specific, huh? Sorry, you can't really do that unless absolutely no one else has. Yeah. I can't. You are so stupid. I said the chairperson is a disfavored person. I'll only be out for six minutes. Unless you're in this situation where literally no other person is willing. Did you ever get a hold of the... Uh, the uh, 